OK, I'm going to go ahead and start today. Thank you all for joining us today for our first North American region um, virtual uh, breeders talk. We are so glad you're able to join us. I wanted to um, let you know that the International Partnership for Dogs welcomes you to this talk, and we are so grateful to have a guest speaker joining us today as well. We have a little bit of housekeeping before we begin the talks today, just to let you know that we do have um, question, a Q&A box and a chat box open. We have um, one of our International Partnership for Dogs team members who will be looking at the Q&A and the chat to help compile questions for the speakers. And we will be trying to address as many of those questions as we can at the end of the two talks. If there are any questions that we cannot answer, um, at the end of the talks or that we simply run out of time for. We will be developing a Q&A after this session that we can share with all of those who have attended and we will also um, post on www.dogwellnet.com which is the website for the International Partnership for Dogs. There will be some follow up information to help you find these resources. And if you have any questions that occur to you after the talks, you're also welcome to share those with us. And we will do our best to be able to provide some resources and support for you. Um, my name is Aime Llewellyn Zadie. I am going to be your um, kind of host and one of your speakers today. And I would very much like to welcome our guest speaker, Dr. Jenna Dockweiler, who is coming to us as a veterinary geneticist from Embark. Embark is um, one of our partners for this today, and we really appreciate them providing a speaker and support for this talk. You're really in for a treat. Dr. Jenna has worked both in general practice and has a specialism in therogenology, and she will be giving you um, lots of information about some of the really practical aspects of um, reproduction, which I'm sure you're all going to be very interested in. And I wish that we could have her here for several hours to answer questions, because I'm sure you're going to be full of them. Um, but we will do our best to um, address those questions in the time that we have her sharing our, her knowledge with us. But she's promised me that we can ask her a few questions by email afterwards that we can share with you as well, because I'm, I'm quite confident you'll I'll be very curious and uh, want to have more time with her. Um, so uh, I'm going to go ahead and launch into the first talk of today, which uh, I will be I guess I'm um, talking to you about some of the considerations perhaps before you go down the, the breeding route and um, things that you may wish to consider in some of the selection of the um, mating partners and breeding plans that you will be developing. Um, whoops, I'm just having a little trouble. I hope you can all see me well. So my talk today will be um, harmonization of genetic testing for dogs, making the most of genetic testing. A little bit about me, as I have a research background in genomics and metabolomics, and I am formerly the head of health and research at the Kennel Club, now the Royal Kennel Club in the UK, where I developed a health team that um, facilitated development of breeder-focused resources and collaborations across the canine health and welfare community. Part of those projects included the International Partnership for Dogs, and when I moved back to the United States in 2017, I joined IPFD to develop the project I'm talking about with you today. Harmonization of genetic testing for dogs was developed as a multi-stakeholder project in response to an internationally unregulated industry. One of the main goals is to be able to provide information in a transparent and evidence-based way about both genetic test providers across the um, test provider spectrum, including academic and commercial providers, and information on both breed-specific tests and um, the research behind the development of genetic tests that can be informative, not just for kennel clubs and breeder resources, but also for veterinary professionals and breeders such as yourselves. 
the development of HDTD was primarily as a focus of supporting those that are trying to provide um, good quality and accurate genetic tests to um, breeders and um, health advisors of all kinds. And whilst there is currently no regulation on, in the industry, a lot of our um, GTPs, genetic test providers such as Embark, really value their participation in HGTD as a way of demonstrating their commitment to provide providing good quality genetic tests and information. On today's talk, I'm going to give a very quick, a little whistle stop tour on genetic testing and modes of common modes of inheritance, ways that you can use harmonization um, to optimize um, the selection and prioritization of the genetic tests, a little bit on genetic diversity and how genetic test results can kind of help you with that, and some further information on resources that are available by um, the International Partnership for Dogs. So what is an inherited disease or trait test? There are two um, common forms. A simple inherited test means that there are, um, there's a single specific variant or mutation that has been identified that can be um, associated with causing a disease or impacting the, um, a trait. So there can be um, a situation where two abnormal variants, one from each parent, must be inherited to cause the disease. And many simple diseases have associated DNA tests. There are also increasingly risk variant tests that may test for a multiple variants or mutations, or they may um, there may be one variant involved that only explains part of why a dog may develop the disease. So for a simple or a recessive inherited disease, you're most commonly going to see for any specific um, gene, in this case, uh, um, progressive retinal atrophy, you could inherit to um, copies of the gene that are normal variants, otherwise known commonly as clear, one normal and one abnormal, which is known as carrier, where the dog will not go on to develop the disease, but has a risk of passing on one copy of the abnormal gene, and affected where the dog may have two copies of the abnormal gene, and so they are most likely um, going to go on or at very high risk of developing a specific disease. For risk variant, on the other hand, the test may include a number, number of different mutations or, as I said, one mutation that kind of describes part of why a test is developed, but doesn't necessarily specifically um, relate to, or, um, pardon me, pardon my language, doesn't specifically and um, precisely account for all of the risk that is involved with inheriting the disease. So in this case, you could see dogs that will be at the higher end of the risk of developing the disease and at the lower end, and there could be a number of other um, external or environmental factors that impact whether or not the dog is at risk of developing the disease. However, it is a really valuable resource to have as it does give you some um, idea of risk associated for breeding and to help select the lower risk dogs for going on into your breeding program. So knowing what variants or mutations your dog carries gives you options for breeding for health and genetic inf information gives you more precision and selecting for the desirable traits and also avoiding disease risks. Generally speaking, a single gene variant test result will be more precise than a multivariate risk test and, and that precision gives you more predictability, which is hugely helpful for developing breeding plans where you're having to consider multiple factors in selecting the optimal dog for breeding. Just a little summary of the genetic tests that are commonly available are the single risk variant tests that we talked about um, a moment ago and the risk or complex inherited. There's also genetic fingerprinting, otherwise known as identification, and also parentage um, testing, parentage panels. All of these types of tests could be included in a panel test, and this will vary um, by the products that are provided um, from your genetic test provider. And the harmonization HGTD, HGTD provides a list of international tests available to dog breeds and dog types. 
So this is our um, website on dogwalnut.com where you are able to see some of the resources that we have available. And one example, I'm just going to um, switch screens to show you, um, bear with me for a moment, um, examples of, oops, pardon me, of what you are able to see. So we're just going to pivot quickly to the website. I hope you are all, oh, bear with me, able to see this just one moment. There we go. I hope you're still able to see me. Um, that uh, this is the uh, Dog Wellnut website. And um, I will just give you the example that I demonstrated for uh, if you go to genetic testing, and if you're searching by breed, let's have a little look at the resources that we have available for the Golden Retriever. So for the Golden Retriever breed, we list all of the genetic tests internationally that are available to the breed. And we have a lot of information that we um, independently source to give you more details about what could be valuable or important for your breeding strategies. You'll see here that next to some of the diseases are little green paw prints. This indicates that there is evidence or research that has been peer reviewed that means that these test results could be more important or more relevant. You'll also see yellow paw prints, which means either these have not been assessed or the research that is available is not particularly conclusive about about whether or not it is meaningful for the breed and a red paw print where when the research has been reviewed, it is not going to be relevant for the breed. In this case, um, these two uh, disease, uh, pardon me, these two conditions have a genetic test associated with them, but this is misidentified um, for the golden retriever. It's actually for a different breed. So this is helpful for the breeder to know which test is associated with their breed and to make sure that they are actually buying the right and using the right test results. You can also see little keys next to these diseases that gives you information called a key comment that may be important um, in um, your uh, breeding strategies and what's important for consideration and usage of that genetic test. So just picking one condition to have a little look at, you can see that we have lots of information about the mutation or the variant that is associated, the different laboratories that provide this test and the breeds that it could be relevant for. We give a little bit of description about what the disease entails and this key comment um, give some specific information for the breed itself. And there are also sometimes application comments about the usage of the test. So you can see there's even more detail about um, breed relevant research that could be useful. And again, the various genetic test providers that um, offer this test. So I'm just going to pivot back to um, my talk again. Thank you for bearing with me on this. And hopefully it's been completely smooth <laughs> as always with these things. So in a little summary of the information that you can find on HGTD on a dog wellnet are all the available tests for breeds and common crosses and mixed breeds. Um, the test providers that offer these tests, research links, including breed specific and type specific information, key comments that help you identify breed specific resources that you might want to consider, and application information that provide test specific information. There really is an abundance of resources that gives you a, a really full picture about the genetic tests that are available and how you can best use them. In some ways, this also is supportive of those who maybe have um, genetic tests um, certificates or information or results that they are struggling to kind of um, decipher, especially if you don't happen to be a geneticist. And having some understanding of your results and some confidence in interpreting those results is key to 
um, preventing the spread of a specific condition and key to giving you um, real control and um, confidence in using genetic tests. Breeding from clear dogs is not always going to be possible or desirable, so having confidence in your test results is a good way in making good breeding plans. So what would you expect to see in a typical test result? Um, you would hope that any test provider you use would have a really clear name and information about um, not only what the test is testing for, but also the breeds that it is relevant for. You may also find specifics on the variant or mutation, but of course you can also find that on HGTD and information about some of the original research. You would also certainly want some confirmation that the um, the breed that you have submitted for testing is the breed you intended, and you should see some kind of clear information about what that individual test result is, in this case, carrier. We would also expect a good genetic test provider to provide clear breeding advice and have resources available for you if you have any questions. Of course, we want you to consider the whole dog. While my talk is focused on genetic testing, we are aware that whilst there have been so many um, mutations and variants that have been identified and associated with diseases and traits, um, that is not the whole picture of the dog's health and the genetic tests that are available. Are, um, many of them do not actually have um, many of the diseases, I should say, in the conditions that are most important to dog breeders do not currently have genetic tests, and this is often the case in complex inherited diseases and conditions such as hip and elbow dysplasia. But a, a tested dog is predictable, and if you have those test results, you can use um, that information to uh, make wise decisions in pairing dogs for low to no risk and help um, keep an eye on genetic diversity. So again, a little whistle stop tour for genetic diversity. Um, you may already be aware of this, but to create a breed, any breed, there is a level of inbreeding. Inbreeding is the other side of the selection coin. The more inbred, the more shared genes, which include the good and the bad genes. And the goal for the breed as a whole would be to reduce or slow the rate of inbreeding and increasing diversity where possible will give breeders more options and it acts as a little bit of a safety net across the breed as a whole. You can find online inbreeding calculators for, for breeds. Many countries have kennel clubs that also provide this information, but you need to be confident that the data that is used in those calculators is informative. Genetic diversity genetic tests are emerging and they vary greatly in precision and usefulness. So again, um, undertaking a little bit of research and consideration and really um, seeking out information from a test provider that you feel has good action points and um, information on what you should do with those test results would be a, a, a good start. Ultimately, for the breed as a whole, aiming to breed for the desirable traits is the goal and not necessarily relatedness. So selection pressure and the genetic bottlenecks is probably terminology that you have heard where people are raising concerns about genetic diversity and inbreeding. The good aspect of selection pressure is that it allows you to eliminate the known inherited diseases, especially if you're using genetic tests for this, and it reduces disease risk for specific inherited conditions. It also promotes and in some cases fixes those desirable traits in the breed. It's, uh, selection is absolutely critical to developing not only a breed, but also um, selecting dogs for health and, uh, and wonderful attributes. The downside of that is that it can reduce your um, genetic options for unknown inherited diseases that can emerge through um, inbreeding. Your inbreeding coefficients can rise across the breed as a whole, and across the breed as a whole, the um, effective population size, by which I mean kind of genetically unique individuals, is diminished. 
And there are many reasons, good and bad, that a breeder may select a particular dog. We hope it's for things like wonderful temperament and movement and um, meeting the breed standard and DNA test results and hit scores. But occasionally it's also for trends in fashion. It could be practical things like the dog lives nearby. And we recognize that these are all um, decisions that are made for better or worse when selecting dogs for mating. So some of the solutions where you do have challenges in inbreeding or you're concerned about inbreeding in your own um, breeding lines or within your um, breed club or breed populations is the number one kind of con conclusion that researchers have come to is limiting the numbers of offspring by individual dogs. Uh, addressing the popular sire challenges is the most efficient way of overall positively impacting genetic diversity but also reducing the relatedness of the sire to dam um, and um, using more available healthy stock so perhaps considering not neutering right away um, and interbreeding as we call it crossing if you have working and showing lines that could be used maybe lines that haven't met previously or have not met in some time could be a way as well as making use of overseas bloodlines and in some cases making very well informed outcrosses this obviously of course varies between breed and breed, which is the most suitable and within mating considerations, even your own personal plans, as well as different countries and kennel clubs have different steps and options in place for um, addressing genetic diversity. But ultimately, as I'm sure many of you who are experienced dog breeders know, the best thing to be is honest with yourself about selecting those mates for breeding. Should these genes continue to improve the breed? How much risk am I taking? Are there ways to reduce the risk by using genetic tests or clinical test results? And good communication between the breeders and future owners can be really helpful. So I really appreciate you listening to this talk. If you um, would like to find more information either on genetic testing, I encourage you to explore Dog WellNet. Um, we are also a nonprofit, so if you feel like making a little donation, we would be grateful for that. And um, I will be closing this down and taking questions um, shortly. Whoops, pardon me. So I hope I hope it's just me and Jenna now. I don't know if someone can confirm in the in the um um oh yes, thank you. <laughs> Good to know. Um and I will take any questions if um uh Katarina would be able to ask some questions or perhaps put some um into the I think there into the are meeting no, chat no oh. questions yet amen no questions yet <laughs> maybe oh, later. wonderful <laughs> maybe yeah. later thank you Katarina well if there are no questions um oh we just we, we did have one question about, um, will this be recorded for later reviewing? Yes, it is being recorded and um, there will be um, a accessibility from Dog Wellnet for you to uh, have a look at these talks again. Well, as there are no questions, I think I will go ahead and hand over to um, Dr. Jenna if that is okay. And then perhaps we can have extra time at the end of the talks to um, answer questions to either one of us, if that suits you. So Jenna, I'm Dr. Jenna, I'm very happy for you to, to take over. <laughs> All right, awesome. Thank you so much, Amay. That was a great presentation. So my name is Jenna Dockweiler, and as Amay mentioned, I am a veterinarian with Embark. So in my role here, my main duties are really education and genetic counseling. And because I am a theriogenologist, which is a specialist in animal reproduction, I do a fair bit of counseling for both individual dogs that are at risk for genetic conditions and for breeders who are looking for information on how to apply results to their programs. So I'm really excited to chat with you today about breeding for health. So let's go ahead and get started. 
So I wanted to share a little bit about myself and my history with dogs since the bios and things that you find online are going to be mostly my academic history. So I've owned dogs since 1996, but have actually been involved in dog sports since 2005. And that's when I started in confirmation with my pointer. So after showing pointers, short hairs, and a few other breeds, I switched to Welsh Springer Spaniels. So I currently have two plus a litter of nine day old puppies on the ground right now. So I'm now more focused on performance sports, but I do still compete in confirmation. So Embark as a company is actually Boston based, but I live in Denver, Colorado with the two dogs, plus the five who are not all staying, <laughs> a cat and a partner. All right, so here's the outline of our topics that we're gonna cover today. So let's go ahead and dive in. I know Amay covered a little bit about what breeding candidacy is, but I wanted to kind of go over what makes a good breeding candidate in my mind. So first for you as the breeder, you should be breeding toward a specific goal. So that could be a sport, a type, reduction of a specific health problem, or potentially something else. And really, we should be making an effort to have each generation improve upon the one before it, though, of course, it's biology. We can't control everything that doesn't always occur, but at least making that effort. Ideally, you should have some homes lined up before you breed or at least have a vision of how you're going to get there, because I know firsthand how crummy it is to have to call a potential home that you've already approved and tell them that you don't have a pup for them. Any pet quality offspring that you produce really should be sterilized, likely not before leaving you or anything like that, but it should definitely be mandated in your contract. And you should remain responsible for that dog throughout its lifetime. So if an owner can't keep it, you should be willing to take the dog back or find them a suitable new home. And then any puppies that we produce really need to be provided with good socialization experiences before they go to their new homes. That critical socialization window is really only between three and 16 weeks. And we have that pup for a really big chunk of that time. So our, we are responsible for getting them set up for success. And you also should be brucellosis testing all of your breeding dogs. So brucellosis is a bacterial disease that's mostly going to be passed through breeding but it can also be passed through other bodily fluids as well. So that includes urine, saliva, milk, really any bodily fluid is considered infectious. So there are a couple reasons that brucellosis is such a big deal. And the first is that it can infect humans and sometimes humans get very severely ill from it. And the second is that it's impossible to fully clear once a dog is infected. So really strict testing and biosecurity is a must with this disease. And it does actually occur more often than you might think. So I don't really have time today to get too into brucellosis during this presentation, but certainly if anyone is interested in chatting more about it, feel free to reach out. So in my mind, an ideal breeding candidate is generally healthy, has a sound temperament, passes all of its breed required health testing, meets the breed standard, contributes positively to the breed, meets the goals of the breeder, and helps maintain the genetic diversity of that breed. So that is a ton of factors to consider. And with a lot of our breeds, especially those with a small gene pool, some of those factors might not be perfectly met. So it's important to remember that there is no perfect dog. So in my mind, the two factors that really shouldn't be sacrificed here are gonna be health and temperament. So because there's no perfect dog, you're likely not going to get everything that you're shooting for in every litter. So I also want to remind everyone to give yourself a little grace because sometimes we do everything right and bad things still do happen with our litters or we miss the mark on what we were shooting for. So our responsibility really is to make the best decisions that we can with the information that we have available to us. All right, moving on to health testing, there are going to be two big categories we think of. So that's genetic and phenotypic health testing. And because Amaya has done a spectacular job covering the genetic health testing, I'm not really going to get too into it here. I do want to specifically point out that just because a dog tests clear of a specific genetic mutation, it doesn't necessarily mean that they will never develop the associated disease because it's always possible to have a new or a different mutation that leads to the same type of disease process. So a really good example of that would be progressive retinal atrophy or PRA. That occurs in a lot of different breeds. There are a lot of different mutations that we've found that are associated with PRA, but there are still a lot of breeds in which we don't know which mutations lead to the disease. So we obviously can't yet test for them. 
And then I'll also point out that there are a few other things that you can discover with genetic testing, so level of inbreeding and coat color. So diversity, as I may mention, is a really important factor to consider, especially in our breeds with our small gene pools. So that coefficient of inbreeding or COI, that's just defined as the likelihood of inheriting two identical genes from each parent. So that's usually expressed as a percentage and that represents the level of inbreeding in an, in an individual. So the COI of an individual is going to increase with increased relatedness of its parents. And again, as May mentioned, I like to remind folks that some degree of inbreeding is absolutely necessary to maintain those desirable, consistent characteristics and traits of our breeds. So it is not all 100% bad. And so that COI can be estimated by using pedigree analysis or by genomic measurements. Those pedigree-based COIs are gonna depend really heavily on record keeping accuracy, of course. <laughs> they usually only go back three, five, sometimes 10 generations. And those pedigree based COIs can deviate really substantially from the genomic based COIs because they're going to assume that 50% of the DNA in any given offspring comes from each parent. That's not entirely exactly true in biology. Also, the founding members of a breed were often related to one another and a pedigree based COI is just never going to take that into account, no matter how far back you go. And even full siblings can have different genomic based COIs because each sibling doesn't inherit the same 50% of DNA from each of their parents. So why do we care then if I've just told you that some inbreeding is necessary to maintain our breed characteristics? And we care because of inbreeding depression. And that's just the term for reduced fitness in the offspring of related individuals. So in the dog, reduced fertility, shortened lifespan, reduced puppy survival, and increased disease prevalence have all been associated with an increased measure of inbreeding. So then what do we shoot for? So I know that this is really, really frustrating to hear, but the average COI varies greatly depending on breed, and there really is no one size fits all approach to maximizing genetic diversity within a population. So unfortunately, there is no one number I can tell you to breed towards to minimize those effects of inbreeding depression, just because it's going to vary so much by breed. But some general strategies can definitely be employed to maintain genetic diversity within a population, which I may already touched on a bit. So first, it is important to know what COI you're actually dealing with in your breed. So either using a genomic measure or a pedigree based COI, you should be able to use that information to estimate COI of offspring of a particular pairing. Because that COI of the offspring depends on how related the parents are to each other, not on how inbred they each are. So even two parents with high COIs could potentially produce puppies with lower COIs if they are not closely related. Second, it's a very important to maintain carriers of recessive diseases within the population. So those individuals aren't going to show signs of the associated genetic disease, and they can be bred smartly to avoid producing at risk puppies just by breeding them to clear animals. So that mating would result in 50% carriers. And in some cases, even animals affected by recessive conditions can be responsibly bred because breeding an affected to a clear would produce 100% carriers, but nobody would be affected. Of course, provided that that breeding doesn't exacerbate the affected dog's condition. So uh, as I may mention, another common pitfall to avoid is going to be popular sire syndrome, where one sire is very overly used within a population. That's definitely a really big one that's going to decrease diversity. So especially in our rarer breeds, we should consider utilizing all of our healthy, stable temperament individuals that we can to help maintain that diversity. So switching gears a tiny bit, I'll just touch really briefly on phenotypic health testing before we move on. So the phenotype of an animal is its set of observable characteristics. So that means that phenotypic health tests are based on the individual animal, and they don't offer any information on the genetics of that animal. So these tests are unable to identify what I would consider to be kind of quote unquote asymptomatic carriers of these diseases. So typically these tests are for things that are caused by multiple genetic mutations or by really complex interactions of an animal's genetics with its environment. So I think the big example everybody thinks of for phenotypic health testing is hip x-rays for canine hip dysplasia. 
but there are a lot of other tests that fall into this camp too. So that would include OFA eye exams, patellar luxation exams, cardiac exams, elbow dysplasia x-rays, and the new respiratory function grading scheme for our brachycephalic airway syndrome kiddos or the, the smoosh-faced breeds. So the x-rays on this slide are of an OFA and a pen hip evaluation of one of my dogs, not the one with the litter, don't worry, who has unilateral hip dysplasia. So this left hip here is nice and tight in that socket, whereas the right one is not covered quite so well by the acetabulum here, the socket of that joint. And you can see on the pen hip, this is the distraction view. So this left hip stayed nice and tight in that socket while this right one was able to be distracted further out of the socket. All right, so next I wanna take you guys through the entire estrus or heat cycle in the dog because it's actually pretty unique compared to other species. And it can help you really understand when and how we breed to get the best pregnancy rates. So just a few basics first, there are four stages of the estrus cycle in the dog. Those are proestrus, estrus, diestrus, and anestrus. Most dogs cycle twice yearly, which means they'll have cycles about every six months. There are a few breeds, such as the Basenji, that only cycle once yearly. That's considered normal. Most dogs are going to enter puberty or have their first cycle between six and 24 months of age. Smaller dogs typically start to cycle sooner, and giant breeds typically start to cycle later. So the graph here on the right is a diagram of the really basic hormonal changes that occur during the heat cycle in the dog. And we're going to go through each of these stages individually. But I just want to let everyone know this graph is not a spectacular work of art because I couldn't find one I liked. So I drew it myself and I am not an artist. All right, so first stage is proestrus then. So this stage is what we would consider going into heat. So you might see bloody vaginal discharge and vulvar, vulvar swelling at this stage. She's going to be attractive to males, but won't yet stand to be mounted. So some girls will exhibit what's called proceptive behavior, and that means that she'll be kind of playful, kind of flirty with males, but again, just won't allow breeding. The average duration of this stage is nine days. It can be a little bit longer or shorter. And estrogen, which is our blue line here, is produced by the developing eggs in the ovary, and that's what's dominant during this phase. And that's actually what leads to all those signs that we see. So that estrogen is going to peak a few days prior to the onset of the next stage of our cycle, which is, of course, estrus. So this is when the female will stand to be bred. She may exhibit flagging, which is a breeding reflex. So if you kind of tickle the inside of the thigh, she'll stand with her tail sort of to the side and the vulva will tip upwards. So if you read the textbook, that bloody vaginal discharge is supposed to change to straw colored, but I can tell you that happens in practice probably only 50% of the time. A lot of girls bleed all the way through. It's not associated with any type of infertility or anything, it kind of just is. So the average duration of this stage is also nine days, but it can be really, really variable. And that's because this stage is characterized by willingness to mate and females are really variable in allowing mounting with some never accepting mating at all whatsoever. So hormonally, there's also going to be a lot going on at this time. So estrogen, which again is our blue line, is falling, while progesterone, which is the red line, is rising. So progesterone, which is the pregnancy maintenance hormone, actually starts to increase before ovulation in this species, which is really, really unique. And the combination of the fall in estrogen and the rise in progesterone causes the brain to release, release a surge of luteinizing hormone, or LH, and that's going to be depicted in purple, that spike there, which is what causes ovulation or release of the eggs from the ovary. So ovulation typically occurs about 48 hours after that LH surge occurs, and those eggs don't mature and become fertilizable for another 48 hours or so. So once ovulation occurs, the female enters diestrus. And typically you can't really see any external signs of this stage, though sometimes they'll act a little clingy, a little lazy, and they may have some mammary development. And this stage lasts 60 days and is characterized by high progesterone. So as I mentioned before, progesterone is that pregnancy maintenance hormone. So this hormone is gonna continue to increase for a few weeks. It's gonna plateau for a few weeks then it's going to slowly wane whether or not a female has been bred or is pregnant. So this is actually really cool. It's an example of atavism or vestigial pack behavior. 
So the idea here is that everyone cycles together, everyone is pregnant or pseudo pregnant together, and everyone's progesterone drops at the same time, which is what leads to lactation. So everyone can care for those wolf pups together. So at the end of this diestrous period is when we sometimes see pseudocyesis or false pregnancy in our dogs. Because progesterone is high, regardless of pregnancy status, really for the whole duration of what would be a canine pregnancy, we can't use this hormone as a diagnostic test for pregnancy like we can in some other species, but we're going to talk a little bit more about pregnancy diagnosis in just a bit here. So the last stage is anestrous, which is the period of uterine repair. So this needs to happen after a pregnancy, after a false pregnancy, or even after just a normal heat cycle. So if this anestrous period lasts less than 90 days, so about four and a half months between heat cycles, we do start to see infertility issues due to inadequate uterine repair. All right, I do want to talk through vaginal cytology a little bit because it is a parameter for breeding management, which we're going to talk about in just a minute. So vaginal cytology, these samples are collected by using a cotton tipped swab and rolling it around the inner lining of the vagina when a bitch is in heat. And this works because the inner lining of the vagina increases in thickness in response to that increasing estrogen, which as we just talked about, occurs during proestrus and estrus. So as that lining thickness increases, the cells that are on the innermost layer of the vagina move further from the blood supply and they're gonna change in appearance. So they turn into what's called superficial cells. So the lining increases in thickness because this helps protect the female from injury during mating. So this picture here is a cytology sample. It's zoomed in pretty far, but it is an estrus sample. So the superficial cells have very angular cell borders, as you can see here. And there's actually a few sperm cells in it as well. So the question was, did they breed? And the answer was, yes, they did. So during proestrus, as that estrogen is rising, we're gonna see an increasing percentage of those superficial cells as that vaginal wall thickens. So again, those superficial cells have very sharp angular cell borders like this guy here or this guy here. We may also see red blood cells at this stage. Again, there's bloody vaginal discharge at this point, so that makes sense. And a lot of times these girls have background debris as well, which is usually just cervical and vaginal mucus. During estrus then, we essentially see only superficial cells as these cells are gonna be furthest from that blood supply at this stage. There might still be red blood cells, but usually that cervical and vaginal secretions have decreased by this stage, so that background is nice and clear. Then the first day of diestrus is characterized by a very sharp decrease in the percentage of superficial cells. So the magnitude of that decrease depends a little bit on who you ask. So some references will say a greater than 20% decrease, some say a greater than 50% decrease. It is typically not at all subtle. So this change occurs because the inner lining of the vagina starts to slough off since that thickened wall is really no longer needed for protection from mating. So importantly, this stage can be really, really hard to distinguish from proestrus. Both are gonna be a mix of superficial and non-superficial cells, unless you have a progesterone level. So if you think back to our lovely work of art graph, <laughs> during proestrus, our progesterone is low, whereas during diestrus, our progesterone is high. And then during anestrus, which we don't usually have much occasion to swab, there really shouldn't be any superficial cells. So all of these guys are nice and round. They have big nuclei. They're nice, round, fat, happy, right up next to that blood supply. In theory, you shouldn't have any red, red blood cells, but the thin lining of the vagina is really easy to accidentally traumatize during this stage. So it's possible that you will see a few. All right, so how do we take all of this information about this canine estrus cycle and use our dog's physiology to maximize our pregnancy rate then? So when we're managing a breeding, we usually start to monitor our female when she's been in heat for around five days or so. So that's gonna be five days after you notice swelling or bleeding. Usually we'll monitor these gals every two to three days, and we like to monitor all of these parameters if we can. We do need serial monitoring because it can be really difficult sometimes to decide exactly where we're at in the heat cycle based on just a single day. I also do like to point out that behavior 
either from the male or the female, can be extremely unreliable. Some males are very interested well before and well after the fertile period, or sometimes if a girl smells different for any reason whatsoever, like say she has an ear infection or a urinary tract infection, some boys will be interested in that. And as we mentioned, some females are going to stand to be mounted for a really long time. So I never recommend relying on the dog to tell us when the optimal breeding time is for those reasons. So with our progesterone timing, baseline typically going to be less than one nanogram per mil. That LH peak occurs at a progesterone level of about two to two and a half nanograms per mil. And ovulation occurs at about four to six nanograms per mil. So these progesterone levels are a little bit machine dependent, but these ranges typically hold true for large send out diagnostic labs. So like IDEX, Antec, those guys. I will point out that some other countries do use different units, so the numbers might be different, but the US largely uses nanograms per mil. So again, we usually measure every other or every third day to really nail down when we hit that two to two and a half and when we hit that four to six. So once we know those LH and ovulation dates, we know when our ideal times to breed are because ovulation occurs about two days after the LH surge and that egg then takes an additional two days to mature. We're typically gonna breed between three and seven days after that LH surge. With a natural mating or even with a chilled overnight shipment, we do have a fair bit of flexibility because good quality semen can last in the uterus for a pretty long time. But with our frozen semen, we really only count on it to live for about 12 hours. So we're gonna wanna wait as long as we can when there are the maximum number of ready to fertilize eggs available to get our optimal pregnancy rate. And actually the leading cause of infertility in the dog is poorly timed breeding. So progesterone timing is very important to nail down our fertile window because again, behavior can be pretty unreliable. So if we have progesterone timing, why would we then also want to monitor vaginal cytology? So we can use cytology to estimate a due date. We can use it to follow gals with any kind of subfertility. We can find weird stuff. So the picture here on the slide is actually of a transmissible venereal tumor. So this dog presented to me for quote unquote persistent heat because she had continual vulvar bleeding, but it was actually due to this mass and she was not in heat at all. And then like the picture on one of the previous cytology slides showed, you can sometimes determine if a natural breeding has taken place. Although if you don't see sperm cells, it's not a guarantee it hasn't occurred. However, the big limitation with cytology is that all estrus slides are gonna look the same. They're all gonna be 100% superficial cells. So you can't determine the date of LH surge, the date of ovulation, or the optimal breeding time. But if you suddenly have a diestrous swab, you can determine if a breeding likely took place too late. So that's really cytology's big utility. I just want to touch on vaginoscopy super briefly because this can also be a useful tool. This is similar to vaginal cytology in that changes of the fluid retention properties of the lining of the vagina change with changing hormone levels. So important for this discussion, at the end of estrus, the vaginal folds are shrunken or quote unquote crenulated. So that appearance is likened to an old person's hand, which is kind of gross, but also a pretty apt description when they're really, really crunchy. So this picture here is not fully crenulated, but it's definitely on its way. These folds do rapidly round back out at the start of diestrus. So vaginal, vaginoscopy has a pretty similar utility and limitations to cytology. It is pretty easy to do, doesn't usually require special equipment, so a trained operator can use a small speculum and a pen light to have a look. This picture is from an actual scoping procedure, just because it's easiest to take pictures with that, but that's not typically necessary just to take a peek. All right, so how do we go about estimating our due date then? So the gestation period of the dog is 63 days or nine weeks. So if we're counting from the LH surge, so either measuring it directly or when our progesterone hits two to two and a half, it would be 65 plus or minus one day because that LH surge occurs two days before ovulation. If we're counting from the date of ovulation, 63 plus or minus one to two days. If we know our cytologic date of day one diestrus, it's 57 plus or minus three days. So a little bit of a looser window, but still not terrible. But if the only information we have is a breeding date, our due date is 63 plus or minus seven days from the date of first breeding. So that is a two week window and a nine week gestation. And for me, that's an unacceptable level of inaccuracy. 
So that occurs for a couple reasons. So first, as we mentioned before, some girls are really receptive to mating for a really, really long time and can certainly be receptive outside of their fertile windows. Second, good quality semen can last a long time in the dog's uterus. There was one study that showed good quality semen can last four to five days and no decreased concentrations and an additional 11 days and only minorly decreased concentration, which is a crazy long time. So besides knowing your optimal fertile window, this is the other big reason that I strongly recommend all dogs, even those who are bred by natural cover, have progesterone timing so that you know, one, when you need to take off work to be present for that whelping, and two, when there may be a problem for which you need to seek veterinary care. Because without progesterone timing, we don't consider gestation to be prolonged until it has been 72 days since the first breeding. So that may end up being totally fine or totally not fine. It just depends on when she actually ovulated, which we need progesterone timing to determine. So for our natural breeding, we typically will breed every other day until the female no longer stands to be mounted if we have the stud available to us. But we also have a few different artificial insemination options. So we can do a vaginal insemination. That's gonna deposit the semen at the front part of the vagina. And that's where the dog would put it were he to breed her naturally. And there are a couple of catheter options for this. So the Mavic catheter has a balloon on it that simulates a tie, whereas the AI catheter just looks like a very long straw. So we actually can't use vaginal insemination with frozen semen because it's not hardy enough to surpass the cervical barrier and achieve an acceptable pregnancy rate. So our intrauterine options then are gonna be transcervical insemination, which is actually what's depicted in this photo, and a surgical insemination. So transcervical or TCI, that's typically done in an awake standing patient. They usually tolerate this super well. I've sedated two in my entire career, takes only a few minutes, super quick and easy. A surgical insemination does require general anesthesia and an abdominal incision. The uterus is kind of pulled slightly out of the abdomen and then semen is injected into the uterus using a syringe. So in my hands, I'm a way faster TCI'er than surgeon, so the TCI is gonna be the better insemination option for me. And pregnancy rates between the two have been studied and are comparable. So we'll typically breed twice, two days apart. Breeding twice versus one time doesn't necessarily change your pregnancy rate as long as our timing is good and our semen is good, but it can increase your litter size. With frozen semen, we breed two consecutive days if we have two doses, which is not terribly common because we don't count on that semen living for a very long time. Again, only about 12 hours. So our pregnancy rates for natural and chilled semen are around 80%, while frozen is around 70%. So these rates are all with good quality semen and good timing of breeding. They obviously are going to decrease if the semen is bad or if the timing is bad. And then the pregnancy rate for frozen semen when it's inseminated vaginally is only 6%, which is why we don't do that. So on the semen side, I just wanna give you all the normal parameters for the dog. So the minimum breeding dose is 100 to 200 million sperm cells. So this is the minimum number that you need to achieve a pregnancy. People like to think it only takes one or a few, but really you need at bare minimum 100 million. So usually doses that are this slow are gonna be our frozen semen breedings. So dogs should produce at least 100 million sperm cells per 10 pounds of body weight. So for example, a 60 pound dog should produce at least 600 million sperm cells per ejaculate. They should have at least 70% normal motility. So at least 70% of those sperm cells should be moving around well and at least 80% normal morphology. So defects that we can see under a microscope should make up less than 20% of the ejaculate. So this picture here is of a two-headed sperm. So here's one head, here's another head, and here's a tail. Um, obviously that's a defect, but this dog only had this one that I could find, otherwise had a good percentage of morphologically normal sperm. I just think this little guy is cute. All right, so we've done our breeding then. So what do we look for then? So some suspicious, though definitely not slam dunk, signs of pregnancy would be pickiness about food around days 18 to 22. Sometimes that can occur sooner, sometimes later. That is thought to be due to the developing placenta producing gastrin, which can upset the stomach. Pale or light pink gums can be seen around day 25 to 30 in some cases. This is due to a normal anemia or a decreased percentage of red blood cells in the blood that develops during pregnancy. That's a normal physiologic finding. 
Some girls will also have clear vaginal discharge around day 28, which is just due to increased mucus production. Uh, and in some cases, abdominal palpation can also be used to diagnose pregnancy. We do need to be extremely careful about this one, though, because pyometra, which is an infection in the uterus, it occurs around the same time frame after a heat cycle, can have what's called a string of pearls feel, and it can feel a lot like pregnancy. And I say these things are not slam dunk. My girl who just whelped nine days ago had none of these symptoms. So it, certainly if you don't see these, it doesn't mean that your girl is not pregnant. And then this picture is just of her ultrasound at 28 days where I was a bit surprised to find fetuses. So definitive diagnostics for pregnancy then would be ultrasound, which is I think what most people are gonna use these days. So we'll typically do that around day 30 since you can see a heartbeat and a placenta at that time. You can get a preliminary count on ultrasound, though it is really, really easy to double count fetuses if you look at the same one in multiple planes. So really it's most useful for saying, do we have a singleton or do we have multiple fetuses? Because that's important information to have. You can also see if there are any resorption sites. We also can take certain measurements on ultrasound. So like head and body diameter to estimate due date in cases where progesterone timing maybe wasn't performed. Radiography or x-rays are typically used for puppy count. So you can technically see mineralized fetuses anytime after day 45, but I like to wait until closer to day 60 because they're a lot easier to see and count at this stage. So this picture is of a 55 day pregnancy x-ray. There are six fetuses. I couldn't go 60 because that was around Thanksgiving <laughs> for, for my girl. So then relaxin is a hormone that's produced by the placenta and that can be measured around day 30. But because this is around the same time an ultrasound can be performed, which is gonna give you more information, it's really not used much for pregnancy diagnosis clinically, but it does exist, so I did wanna mention it. So that takes us through pregnancy essentially, and that's actually all I have for you today. So you can reach me anytime at this top email address here, or you can reach out to our general breeders email address here uh, if you have any questions. And with that, I will happily take any questions. We do have one question that's in our Q&A already that is 100% for you and not for me. And it's um, <laughs> asking if you have any tips on how to shorten the anestrus without compromising fertility. So first thing is we don't want to shorten it if we're going to be shorter than about six months between cycles, because again, that can interfere with fertility. But there are a couple of different protocols uh, that we can use to try to, to bring a bitch into season. None of them work great. I will say because the bitch cycle is so unique and so you know out of left field compared to any other species, we don't have great pharmacologic control of it. But cabergolin is the drug that's typically used to try to bring bitches into season. So you can certainly ask your veterinarian about that. And I think we just have one more that um, has been indicated in the chat. We're just going to wait for um, our guest to um, type it out for us. While we're waiting for you to um, formulate any questions, um, I will also say that we are very happy to take questions after this talk um, that you can email either to myself at um, the uh, at dog well net, or you can also um, perhaps um, follow up when you get our our information post seminar to provide questions. And we, if you want to get them to us before the weekend, then Jenna and I can have a look at them and hopefully pull together um, answers to questions over the weekend for early next week. Um, we just have a couple of more questions that come in. Um, how can you prevent reabsorptions? That's a Jenna question. So it depends on what is causing those resorptions. So typically, if you have just one or maybe a few that are in a, an otherwise healthy litter, that we think is probably something that is genetically amiss with that specific fetus. So that's not something that you would really want to necessarily prevent from occurring. If you are having a full litter resorbing, that could be due to infection or inflammation. So one thing I would say is no raw diets during pregnancy. 
Uh, they definitely cannot handle pathogens the same level. It's the same reason pregnant women can't eat deli meat. So we don't want any raw diets during pregnancy. So that's one possibility that I would, you know, remove as, as a possible cause for resorptions. But otherwise, it would uh, take doing some diagnostics through your veterinarian to determine what's causing it and then formulating a treatment plan. Thank you very much. We have another question that I will read out and then I will provide a little answer. And if Jenna, if you want to chime in as well, um, that would be great as well. Uh, the question is, what percentage COI do you consider healthy or safe um, if it is still needed nowadays, both pedigree and genomic? And Jenna kind of mentioned that there's not one particular number, but the the advice that I would always give, whether you're using um, pedigree or genomic information, is that you try to consider this um, relative to the breed as a whole. So the goal would ultimately be to reduce the rate, like how quickly the um, the coefficient of inbreeding is increasing within the breed as a whole, but that could also apply to your own breeding line. So if you are in a breed that is rare and maybe just kind of naturally currently highly inbred, you will have a different set that is a reasonable goal or aim than you would for a, a breed that is a little bit more naturally diverse. So if you happen to have resources either through COI or through your kennel or breed club, um, a real kind of Basic principle would be to breed at or below the breed average if you happen to have access to the breed average. But um, another way is, I guess, the lower you can go without compromising the choice of the dogs that you're using is a good method. And honestly, any kind of step that you're taking to head in a positive direction would be a really good idea. I don't know if I've already covered what Jenna might want to say, but if you have anything else to add to that, um, you're very welcome to. Yeah, yeah, no, I think that's that's a great answer. And the only thing I would add is that it's one parameter. You know, we don't want to get tunnel vision, just look at COI at the expense of, of everything else that we're trying to consider. So it's just a consideration. Absolutely. And then um, pivoting back more to um, the veterinary specific side of things, um, we have a question about a recommend, if you would recommend a round of antibiotics prophylactically prior to pregnancy. Again, so, a Jenna question. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. The short answer is no. The more we are learning about the dog's microbiome, so that is the population of little bacteria that live normally on humans as well, the skin, the respiratory tract, some of those do live in the vagina and the uterus as well. We don't want to cause an imbalance of, of those things. So in the absence of any clinical signs or a history of pregnancy loss or anything along those lines, I don't recommend prophylactic antibiotics. Okay, and um, somewhat in that same universe, um, a question about any recommended um, supplements for the bitch before or during pregnancy, and they gave some examples of Oxymate or um, does anything in the diets affect litter size, and they gave an example of a Royal Cannon product. Do you have any comments on supplements before, during, and it sounds like maybe even if they affect litter size? Yeah, sure. So, so the biggest thing that we want to think about with any supplement is the calcium to phosphorus ratio. So that should be between 1 to 1 to 1.2 to 1 during pregnancy. So after whelping, we do like to supplement with calcium because that's when lactation demands for calcium are very high on the bitch's body. But if we give her too much calcium during gestation, that can actually predispose her to developing low calcium after she whelps. So whatever supplement it is, it's just really important to look at that ratio and make sure that we're not throwing her off. The only other big supplement that a lot of folks will use is folic acid that has been shown to decrease the rate of cleft palates in certain breeds and is certainly not harmful. So that's something that, that you could give as well. And then diet related, what we like to avoid are any kind of phytoestrogens. So those are plant-based estrogen-like compounds. They're usually found in plants like soy. So a lot of like vegetarian diets will have very high levels of those and that can certainly interfere with reproduction. 
Um, and as a human who reproduced, that kind of goes for us as well. <laughs> Many of the same things need to be avoided. Um, my IT helper very kindly reminded me of our own info email. It just flew out of my head. If you have questions after this talk that you would like, either myself or Jenna or both, or we can find another expert as well, we're open to all questions, you can email us at um, info at ipfdogs.com. So that's info at ipfdogs.com. Um, and you can also see both for Embark and for IPFD our web addresses on the screen at the moment if you want to go and look at some of the other resources. I'm just going to give a couple more minutes maybe for any burning questions and then um, we, oh, we open up. Um, or, or we invite you to um, email us afterwards as well. Oh, we just have a question. Can vaccination, and they gave an example of rabies, have harmful influence when given at beginning of pregnancy? Yeah, sure. So we like to avoid vaccinating pregnant bitches when at all possible. The, the short answer is that we don't know exactly how vaccines will affect a pregnancy. Rabies is probably a lower risk because that is a killed vaccine. It's not a modified live, but if we can avoid vaccinating, then we do avoid vaccinating. Of course, it's important that she's well vaccinated prior to becoming pregnant. And then another um, Jenna question, what is the risk of multiple ultrasounds of a bitch around the 28 to 32 days time frame, assuming a good professional machine and operator? So any level of ultrasounding that that you would do or to monitor a pregnancy has been proven to be safe. So you would have to be really, really ultrasounding an awful lot to, to have any any kind of effect. And really the only effects that have ever been shown are in rats and they were exposed to like extremely high, not really what we would use clinically levels of ultrasound. So it, it shouldn't be a big concern. And then a question for me and, and maybe Jenna as well, if you'd like to pitch in, but a question if there is a genetic test for hip dysplasia prevalence. Um, a little background on hip and elbow dysplasia, the genetic compounds or component, I should say, um, is estimated to be about 45% of describing why a dog may be at risk for um, developing hip dysplasia. And there have been genetic risk tests that have been um, developed to try to give some indication of risk or prevalence for hip and elbow dysplasia. But to the best of my knowledge, the research and evidence that's behind those is not particularly precise or robust. So you may be able to find a genetic test provider that offers a hip or elbow dysplasia test, but in many cases in the genetic researcher world and in a lot of the veterinary world, it's not considered to be particularly robust at this time. It's still best practice to have a phenotypical or clinical examination. And the added benefit of having that clinical examination is you're also getting really good information about the individual dog's health and health risks as well. So you kind of get two for one. You get your own dog's health information and you get some idea of the potential risk for passing on inherited diseases. There are, however, estimated breeding values that are available for hip and elbow dysplasia. And I think some places have patella luxation and other associated conditions, and that is a really great way of trying to um, be more precise at a level of precision to that phenotypic information to be able to determine those that have a higher genetic risk, um, which is not necessarily reflected in the phenotypic risk or the phenotypic development, as we know that hip and elbow dysplasia have those environmental factors that contribute to how well or how much or not um, a dog may go on to develop those conditions. I hope that's somewhat helpful. I don't know, Jen, if you have anything else to add to that. Oh, a great, great overview. <laughs> um, and then uh, pivoting again back to you, definitely for you, are any recommendations to optimize sperm counts in stud dogs? So, um, Fit, sorry, can't speak. Fish oil <laughs> has been shown to have a beneficial effect. Um, really anything, any sperm that we see in a, the ejaculate has actually been made two months ago. 
So any treatment that you institute, you do need to wait that full two months before you recheck him. So that's something that people kind of forget about or like, you know, it's December now, but two months ago here, it was still pretty hot. So we would need to wait another two months potentially before we would see an improved uh, spermiogram in those dogs. But really fish oil is the only thing that's been proven to, to potentially be beneficial. And we have a couple of people who've asked questions about reabsorption of puppies or absorption of puppies. Are there any risks that are associated with the absorption of fetuses and, and maybe a little explanation of what causes absorption of identified puppies? Yeah, so so again, if you just have a few in an otherwise healthy litter, it's probably something amiss with that fetus specifically. But other things could be all sorts of infections. So brucellosis potentially can cause resorptions. Canine herpes virus can potentially cause resorptions, as well as any reason for, for the bitch to be sick otherwise. Like if she develops a high fever for any kind of unrelated reason, then potentially that can lead to resorptions, um, as well as some nutritional things. And, and those raw diets as well can, can cause resorptions. I've seen that happen a couple of times, which is really unfortunate. And um, we also have a question, uh, can newborn puppies have a different age from one or two days when dogs meet several times during the heat? For example, if the dogs live together or multiple matings, I think. Yeah, That's yeah. What they're so referring to. Yes, yes. So even though the dog may stand to be mounted for many, many days, all of those eggs are going to be released really in pretty much the same time frame. And even if some of them are fertilized a little bit later, there are mechanisms for them to catch up. So like if we have a, a particularly small puppy or, or something along those lines, it's usually not a different gestational age. It's typically small for another reason. And um, I'm just going to jump in um, from wearing my other hat uh, many moons ago working at the kennel club if you have multiple entire males and you have a bitch that is in heat and you're mating um, do really take extra care and if you happen to be in one of those breeds that um, is struggling with genetic diversity um, there are many places that uh, many breed and kennel clubs that are very open to multiple matings to get a little bit more genetic diversity for each cycle so you could have two genetically um, less related males or not related to each other uh, to one bitch and then within that litter of puppies have a couple different sires so you're kind of getting extra sires per um, pregnancy to increase that genetic diversity of course there's no guarantee about how those puppies are going to land so if you have six puppies you're not guaranteed to get three from one sire and three from another but it is a technique that um, particularly rare breeds have been using and the um, identification of the sires afterwards is easily done through genetic parentage testing so there are some creative resources for those breeds that need a little extra consideration when it comes to genetic diversity um, pivoting back to more specific uh, veterinary or um, puppy questions, we have a question about a recommendation to tube feed newborn pups for the first week to avoid aspiration, even if they're born healthily. Jenna, do you have a comment on that? So I tend to be pretty hands off. Nature knows best. So that's not something that I would personally ever recommend. And that's for a few reasons. One, the bitch's first milk is what's called colostrum. So that's what contains antibodies, which normally fight infection. So the, the puppy has a very limited time window where they can absorb that colostrum and actually be protected from diseases that the dam is protected from, either if she has seen those diseases in the past or if she is vaccinated against them. So there's no formula that's gonna replicate that, that colostrum. So that's one reason. And the second reason is you're much more likely to cause an aspiration with tube feeding. It is pretty easy to do. And if you do need to do it, by all means, but, but doing it prophylactically, you're likely to cause more problems than you're going to solve. Thank you. And uh, do you have a tick remedy for pregnant bitches that you would recommend? So there are several that have been tested in pregnant and lactating bitches and have been found to be safe. I don't live in a big tick area, so I don't use one personally. <laughs> um, but if you look at the product label, you should be able to see if they've been tested safe for pregnancy and nursing. 
And then um, I, I think we have two more questions that I think I'd like to finish on because I believe we've either overrun our time or are very shortly going to be overrunning our time. But I feel like these are really good ones to do now. And then if you have any further questions, please, please do email us. The first is, can brucellosis be found in frozen semen? Yes, it can potentially survive the, the freezing process. So sometimes people will sacrifice a straw to test for brucellosis um, if it is potentially a concern. And are there any ways to prevent pyometria? So the best way to prevent pyometria is to have the uterus be pregnant until you are no longer using it and then <laughs> spay, spay the dog. Um, there are certainly some breeds that are more at risk than others, but there's not any one preventative measure that, that you're gonna take other than spaying that, that would be perfectly preventive. Wonderful. Thank you so much for everyone who was able to attend uh, today and to join us. And thank you, Jennifer Stain. Uh, Jenna for staying those extra minutes. There were just so many good questions that I really felt I had to just steal you while we while we had you. But please do email us and I'm sure we can answer more in the future. And we will also try to summarize what has already been answered here and put that online as well. So you can refer to some of these answers um, and these questions again to get a little bit more information in case you didn't have time to write it down or if you um, want to just review it. And we have already had as well a few questions about accessing these talks and this information afterwards and yes everyone who attended will be contacted after this meeting and there will be resources over the next uh, couple of weeks um, uh, on dog walnut that you can come back to and have a look at to um, see these talks and have some more information um, provided to you so thank you thank you again for joining us and I hope you have a lovely wonderful morning evening afternoon uh, wherever you happen to be in the world today so thank you again thank you